welcome to this edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast, sponsored by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. My name is Brian O'Connor. I'm an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at Chicago Booth, and I'm pleased to be joined today by my good friend, Matt Estep of uh, Midwest Supplies and Bosworth Capital. Matt, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah, great. Well, Matt, I think uh, our viewers and listeners would love to hear a little bit about your sort of background and your story and how you got involved in this crazy world of search funds and entrepreneurship through acquisition. Sure. So uh, a little bit of background on myself in the search fund world. Uh, I went to a dinner in 2005 with a gentleman who had recently graduated from uh, Stanford with his MBA. and. Uh, had raised this pool of capital uh, to do this search fund concept. And on the way home, I said to my then girlfriend, ultimately my wife, that I didn't know what that was, but I wanted to do that. If I ever had the means with which to do it, and at the time, I was working uh, for People's Energy here in Chicago. Uh, so I had no business acumen. I was a mechanical engineer. And ultimately, uh, was very fortunate a couple years later to get into HBS. And I went to HBS with the intent of doing a search fund. So I spent two years at HBS studying the search fund model. 2008 came out, and I raised the search fund, and then uh, the rest is history. Great, great. Rewind one second. I think we'd be interested to hear a little bit about what you did before Peoples, Matt, if you could share. Yeah. So I, uh, I sort of tell people I was the most uh, unqualified guy you've ever met to, to buy a business. <laughs> and uh, I spent about 17 years of my life driving race cars uh, and ultimately was doing that for a living until I was hurt. Uh, so I was, I was the uh, atypical uh, professional race car driver at HBS. Very interesting story. Thank you for, for sharing it. So um, what I'd like to start with is uh, understanding a little bit more about how you sourced uh, Midwest Supplies. Maybe give a little bit of a background on the company, the nature of the business, the industry that you played in, and, and talk a little bit about sort of um, how you unearthed this opportunity and where you did so in your search process. I searched, I spent about 80% of my time searching, calling companies directly, just a proprietary sourcing companies across a myriad of industries. 20% of my time was spent um, working with brokers, bankers, intermediaries, accountants, lawyers, anybody that might have deal flow. And specifically, Midwest Supplies, the company we bought, came from a broker that was based here in Chicago that had found a company up in Minnesota um, that he was trying to sell. So I had looked at a deal that the broker had probably about month 10 or 11 in my search, and in about month 21 or 22 in my search, he reached out proactively to me and said, hey, I know of an opportunity, would you be interested? And uh, I would say in general, the materials were fairly poorly put together, and uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I think a lot of the reason I was able to buy it was because the materials were so poorly put together. Had sure. they been really well put together, somebody else would have bought it. Yeah, so, so perhaps a little bit of a, um, an interesting angle on a brokered or bankered process that might have not been as efficient as the way that we might think about uh, a widely auctioned uh, buying opportunity. Right, so um, this, he ran a, I would call it an inefficient auction to sell the business. So ultimately, they brought up five parties for management meetings. It was two private equity firms, two strategics, and then uh, a search fund. And ultimately, we were the uh, not the highest offer. We were in the middle of the road. But the owner decided to sell because uh, he was 43 years old. He spent two days a week in the business. The business was growing rapidly, and it had clearly outgrown him. And uh, he ultimately thought we would take the best care of the employees. That was the fundamental reason why he sold to us. So when you thought about your your competition in that in, in that um, situation, maybe uh, a, <clears throat> a private equity buyer, a financial buyer, or uh, a strategic buyer, or potentially the opportunity to hold on to the asset and not sell the business, do you believe that that might have been sort of the the rationale or the reason for him deciding to move forward with Bosworth? It definitely was the reason he decided to move. I mean, he told us unequivocally, I sold you the business. And after we had the transaction, he said, I sold it to you because I thought you'd take the best care of the employees. So he built this business just on sheer brute force. There were no processes, no systems, nothing. So as a business was 10 million in revenue, 2 million of EBITDA, had 54 employees. He was friends with 54 employees, <laughs> you know? So that was really important to him. And as he looked at selling to the strategic, so there's really, in the end, there was three of us. There was a strategic, there was a private equity firm based in Chicago, and then there was a search fund. And uh, the private equity fund wanted him to keep working for two years. He wanted to leave at closing. If he could have left at closing, it would. The strategic was probably gonna shut the business down and bring the stuff in house. So in both scenarios, we offered him something. Um, one of the key things in the management meeting was that I asked him was, what did he want to do post-closing? Like, what was an ideal situation for him? And he said, he looked at his banker, and then he looked at 
looked at me and then he looked at his banker again and he looked at me and there clearly was like some type of awkward tension there. <laughs> and he, uh, he said to the banker, can I, can I tell him the real answer? And the banker sort of looked begrudgingly at him and said, sure, I, you know, go ahead. And uh, the owner of Midwest Supplies said, you know, I thought selling my business was like selling real estate. You know, you sign a bunch of documents, you get to closing, you push a check or a wire across the table, and then you send the keys the other way, and then I walk away. And uh, well, I said to him, I, you know, I don't, I don't know enough yet to say that, that you can do that, but all I wanted to know was that's your objective. So everything we did then as it related to structuring the deal was tied around focusing on how do we take care of the employees and how do we get this guy out of the business as quickly as we could. It, it was clearly the right situation for him and the right fit for him. How did you know that it was uh, the right fit for you, that this was the asset that you were going to ultimately take over and, and run on a day-to-day -day basis and, and create value in and work with all of these 54 employees? At that time, I probably toured 75 businesses throughout the course of my search up until that point. And how many months, Matt, were you into the search at that point? I was about 21 months into the search at that oh, point, so okay. pretty far along. It took another four or five to close the transaction. So um, it's back to the point of being unqualified to search. It took me a little longer than most. <laughs> um, but uh, it was one of the few businesses that after touring the facility, so we did the management meeting and then we toured the facility and they were in about a 45,000 square foot warehouse. And I remember walking out into the parking lot after the tour with somebody that was with me and I turned and said to him, I can run the business better today than it's being run. And I didn't say that from a point of arrogance or a point of confidence. It was, there was, uh, I often tell the story, people say, you know, how did you, how were you so successful with Midwest Supplies? Was there a lot of low hanging fruit? And I say, well, actually it wasn't low hanging, it was on the ground. And the objective was truly like pick it up before it rots. It was just, there was not a whole lot there, but the business was growing very rapidly. Yeah, so that's a, that's a nice segue into what I'd like to touch on next, which is sort of the early days, post-acquisition. You've bought this business. You and your partner have now taken occupancy as the heads of this business. <clears throat> what, were, what were some of the surprises, and maybe things that you didn't uncover during diligence that uh, took you off guard out of the gate? I think just in general, uh, the biggest surprise to us was just the lack of sophistication in the business. We, we knew it was unsophisticated, but I don't think we as new operators really knew what that meant on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, initially the, the, the owner's wife was the accountant. Like, my partner had a CPA, so I expected like, okay, he'll be able to take over the accounting function. And I sort of tell the story of how, you know, three or four weeks after closing, he called me when I was back in Chicago, the business was in Minneapolis, and asked about like making an accrual for an insurance payment. And I said to him, I was like, David, I don't even know what an accrual is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you're in such gory detail early on when you don't have resources. Um, that was probably the biggest surprise. Sure. And I think uh, the other just big surprise, I would say, was how hard it was to put that stuff in place. Sure. So whether it be an accounting system, an ERP system, things like that. Any horror stories? We always get concerned that, you know, you're going to uncover a skeleton in the closet that you didn't uh, realize. Now, it's clear that the investment played out and the thesis worked and um, all's well that ends well. But any early horror stories? Yeah, probably, I, I don't know that it was a horror story, but I would say, you know, I can give you a couple of just anecdotal stories. We, shortly after closing, learned uh, the gentleman that was running the IT department, we effectively had an e-commerce company that was selling home brewing and home winemaking equipment online, uh, had been a convicted felon and had committed white collar crime for stealing money from a company. Um, so we learned that afterwards that was relatively unpleasant to deal with. Um, but uh, other than that, there were no huge surprises. How about, how about the, the challenges? You mentioned low-hanging fruit, some fruit on the ground that was just easily picked up. Um, how about some of the things that you maybe underestimated would require uh, the involvement of you and your partner and, and provided for challenging situations? I, I think the, the, the hands down the most challenging thing for us was the business had grown 35% year over year up until we bought it. And then when we bought it, we increased the growth rate. We had the ability to increase it orders of magnitude greater. What we struggled with was putting the systems and processes in place to handle the growth. Sure. So one of the things the board did really well early on was sort of harnessing David and I such that we didn't sort of run wild with the growth and not have an ERP system in place, a warehouse management system in place. We could get more orders than we could handle from a fulfillment perspective, from a customer service perspective. And, and the amount of time and energy it took for David and I to put that stuff in place was a challenge. Sure, you, you, you touched on the board there. Um, how did you think about putting that group together, Matt? And how did you leverage them in the early days where you were sort of learning things on the fly? You know, it's interesting. I think one of the challenges with um, most search funds or anyone that's buying a business, whether it's through a search fund or funded search, is or unfunded search, is um, most people have never been in a dynamic where they were 
a CEO or a president and had a board of directors that they're somewhat answering to. So oftentimes I think it's a de facto and it just defaults to who puts the most money in. There's not a lot of thought in you know, who has the time, who has the resources, who's the right person. And I think it's one of the biggest things is I try and counsel searchers about thinking about who do you want to work with, who has the right skill set. Um, so for us, it really was just a function of who had the time to commit and who was writing the bigger checks. Explain to us maybe how uh, that interaction looked. I'm, I'm assuming it was different for different directors, um, but what was the ad hoc, periodic, and then regular sort of touch points that you maintained with your board of directors? Yeah, so I feel very fortunate. I ascribe probably 40% of our success directly to the board of directors, and I say that from the perspective of early on, they were very, very involved. Uh, they weren't board members, they weren't mentors. I mean, they were one step removed from like a full-time consultant to David and I, and we probably talked to them five to 10 times a week early on, and um, it was probably up until about month nine where that relationship continued like that, and then it slowly started to peel back. Um, but it was amazing to me, just their general business experience trumped anything we were seeing on the ground, and that was a real struggle for us. It was sort of a lot of back and forth, where we said, hey, how, how can this be? And they would say, you know what, you have to do this. And yeah. we would say, well, why? Well, it's, it sounds like you guys had the foresight to assemble the right group and leverage them in, in a pretty meaningful way early on to solve for some inexperiences, which is, which is smart. Um, I'd love to say there was thought. It was, it was, <laughs> it was probably a lot of luck. Um, sh shifting gears a little bit to sort of value creation and leading up to the ultimate exit, uh, the ultimate sale of Midwest Supplies, um, you know, you, you drop this uh, very sophisticated um, uh, offering memorandum to your investors and has all these value creation levers uh, and ways in which you're going to make this business fantastic. Um, how did those actually play out vis-a-vis -vis your underwriting thesis and what were the big ones that really drove growth for Midwest Supplies? So a lot of the growth for us was that we could just expand the customer base. So we were in a growing industry. It was probably growing between 15 and 20 percent a year when we bought the business. And that continued. So for us, a lot of it was uh, putting the systems in place from a marketing perspective to go out and capture a significant portion of the market share um, on the growth side. So that part of the thesis, I think we, we outperformed significantly. Where we underperformed was the costs that needed to be layered into the business to capture that growth. Sure. So if you looked at, you know, if you uh, go back and read the story now, you would see we grew the business from a revenue perspective far greater than we ever expected. So I think by the end of the second year, we had outgrown our fifth or sixth year projection on a revenue perspective, um, but just missed what the cost would be to do that. Yeah, what was the, so, and, and it sounds to me like there was probably some margin compression as you were going through, and, and people talk about sort of the J curve associated with growing these small businesses. Can you give us a little bit of um, sort of insight into what that looked like? How long did it take for EBITDA margins to sort of come back to their steady state, and if they ever did, and hopefully they exceeded, um, where you believed that they uh, would be steady, sort of in the long run. Yeah. So for us, where the margin compression came was all people. So we hired a leadership team of people to help with marketing and sourcing, and on the IT side of our business and merchandising, that we layered in about a million dollars in cost, just on, a, on an annual basis for salaries. Um, and that was th those were decisions that were made pretty much immediately post acquisition within the first started about month six okay so we started month six with a CFO and then we moved to a marketing person then we moved to an IT person so we sort of went through every functional area of the business for the first about six months David and I fought through trying to do those things ourselves and we ultimately realized we weren't very good at accounting or marketing or any of the functional areas <laughs> um, but we used a lot of brute force and we, we figured it out but um, uh, we were just very fortunate. We added a ton of SG&A, as I said, but we were able to suck out uh, cost of goods sold. So when we bought the business, there was a very small portion of the business that was private label products. We were able to greatly increase the, the share of the private label products, and we sourced a lot of those internationally. So we were actually able, from an EBITDA perspective, to maintain margin, um, but we had sort of underwrote a thesis that we could actually improve margin. So gross margin improvement, some, some operating expense sort of higher than you anticipated, leading to a sort of net neutral impact on EBITDA margins. Uh, interesting. Um, fast forward, you ran the business for how long? Uh, 27 months. 27 months. I can take that back. Ran the business for 26 months. I searched for 27 months. <laughs> so a, a relatively short holding period. Um, what drove the decision to exit? and explain a little bit about sort of that process and who you ultimately exited to 
So we, uh, about a year into ownership, had the opportunity or started dialogue with our largest competitor to potentially try and buy our largest competitor. And uh, while we thought we had gotten an agreement to buy it, the company from our largest competitor was also founder-owned. Uh, in the 11th hour, he sort of pulled a 180 and ultimately sold to a private equity firm. Uh, we had already put together a pretty strong thesis of why these businesses should be put together. We went to the private equity firm and said, hey, maybe we could still do this. You guys are smart guys. We're smart young guys. Let's put these businesses together. And they sort of uh, just sort of looked the other way. About a year later, which was about month um, 23 or 24 of our ownership, they ultimately came to us proactively and said, uh, we would like to buy your business. And we sort of said, well, we'd like to buy yours, and how do we settle this? And uh, in the end, they basically came to us and said, you know, give us a number with which you'll sell the business. So we talked to our board, of course, of a couple of days. We went back to them with a number, and a few days later, we had a signed LOI, and 72 days later, the deal closed. Wow. Um, and throughout those 72 days, uh, David and I really sort of split the the roles of the business. I spent 100% of my time just running the business, and David spent almost 100% of his time making sure the transaction closed. Managing the sale process. Now, I I explain sort of the dynamic at the board level, and was there ever a discussion around um, should we engage an investment bank and sort of run a little bit more of a, uh, a traditional process, um, you know, uh, or, or was it that, you know, we have this great opportunity in our hand, why would we, uh, why would we jeopardize that yeah. with, with running a, a process? I mean, yeah. Explain sort of the rationale. I'm assuming that there was a discussion there was, at the board level. There was definitely a discussion. I think the number we gave to the potential buyer from everybody's perspective was far greater than what a market price was for the business because we really weren't in the interest of selling it for any sort of market value because we saw sort of a 24-month period where we thought we could continue to grow the business and continue to improve margin. So if you looked at it from an EBITDA multiple perspective, it just didn't make a lot of sense. Sure. It would make no sense to any other buyer than them. Sure. Uh, and, and, and is that because of the sort of the strategic implications of the, of the combined correct. company post-acquisition? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And they looked at it from a synergistic perspective that I don't know that we agreed with, but they believed in. And that's at the end of the day all that mattered. Uh, but there was definitely, even once we signed the LOI, about halfway through the process, there was, a, there was some dialogue with the board of do we still want to do this and it's centered much more around how the buyers were going to handle um, my partner and I going forward so we entered in the agreement and it was one expectation and then about the middle of diligence it, it sort of diverged and, and the board basically came back to David and I and said if you guys don't want to sell the business like feel no obligation we'll, we like the place we're going just keep doing it so it definitely was not always uh, a clear path. So Matt you mentioned uh, during the sale process, there were implications for both you and your business partner. Um, help us understand sort of what that meant during the process and then post acquisition, how it actually played out. Did one of you stay on? Did one transition out? Or was it uh, sort of more of a, a package deal? Help yeah. us understand that dynamic. So when we signed the deal to sell, it was a sort of a package and an expectation that David and I would continue to run the business in the way we did. And we sort of ran it very collaboratively and we got along very well. Um, the buyer uh, ultimately sort of left it open-ended. It said, oh, don't worry, you guys will keep running the business. About halfway through diligence, as I said, the buyer basically said, well, somebody's going to have to be the CEO and somebody else isn't. And, and I was the isn't. So, uh, and just said, you know, I'm not interested in working for David or working for any real CEO. That's not, not what I signed up for. You know, I, I'm happy to help in any way I can, but I'd like, would like to leave. And they were very amicable with that. And uh, ultimately I stayed for about 90 days post-transition, okay. uh, post-transaction, and then I was able to leave. David uh, stayed on with them and was ultimately the president of the company. Okay, great. And, and, and so maybe backtrack just for a second here. So. Did that have anything to do with your roles while operating the business? And how did you guys uh, bifurcate responsibility between you and David? You know, we've seen arrangements whereby one will take sort of more of the internal and operations focused role, and the other being sort of more external or customer oriented. Yeah. How, did, how did you think about your responsibilities while operating the business? Yeah, I think we sort of thought about it. We said, you know, what is, what's David's skill set and what's my skill set? And ultimately, like, if I remember correctly, David did like finance and marketing and IT initially, and I did operations and HR. And you know, a few of those things got passed back and forth during, even though we only operated the business for a little over two years. But it, a lot of it was just what was our skill set. And then ultimately, um, upon sale, a lot of their rationale for David sticking around was uh, they felt like he his skill set was was better suited to run the big business, bigger business. So you've had an exit, you, you, you successfully searched, you acquired your business, you ran it and had a, a, a generated a, a very interesting return for your investors and for yourself. 
what does life look like now? What is the uh, sort of search fund or ETA graduate that has a successful outcome, uh, what does that path look like post-sale? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So that, uh, I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what that did look like. You know, I talked to a lot of people that had done search funds or bought companies and been successful, and uh, uh, I would like to tell you I had figured it out, but I don't know that I have. So today it looks like the following. I spend about 90% of my time searching for businesses uh, with my own capital, and then about 10% of my time I spend with search funds. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like I was the least qualified guy ever to go and buy a business, and part of the reason I was successful was there were a lot of other search funds who were really helpful to me. So for me, it's somewhat philanthropic in that I'm giving time back to other searchers, but I also think it's a really good investment. So I invest, obviously, a, a significant amount of my own money in search funds. That's great. Well, um, thanks, Matt, for joining us. This has been a pleasure interviewing you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us on this edition of the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition podcast, sponsored by the Polsky Center for Entrepreneurship.